Well, hello everyone. Um, it is about 12.01 p.m. Um, I am in Ontario, Canada, um, and welcome to our Filecoin Core Devs call number 60. Um, today we have we have a number of things to discuss. Um, starting from switching to new drug network by Patrick, we have Beyond FVM. Um, by Steb and his team. We also have a discussion on FIP67, which is on poor rep security policy and replacement ceiling enforcement. Um, then Molly will do a quick shout out um, and perhaps announcements on, on the Filecoin Dev Summit coming up. We'll then hand over to Caitlin to discuss uh, or clarify um, the NV21 watermelon upgrade. If we can please mute our mics if we are not speaking. Um, thank you very much. Um, after the NV21 watermelon discussion, we will just take general questions if we do have time um, and take it from there. Um, just give me a second to admit more folks who are in the lounge um, waiting. Uh, da -da. Yes, we have everyone. So welcome everyone. So I am handing this now over to Patrick to take us through the first discussion. Over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Lucky. Um, I'm Patrick from the DRAND team, for those of you who don't know. Uh, DRAND obviously is the randomness speaker and used in Filecoin for leader election and a bunch of other proof stuff. Um, since March of this year, we released a new network that's been running in parallel with our existing DRAND network. Uh, that emits randomness every three seconds instead of 30 seconds. Um, we have raised a FIP for transition of uh, the Filecoin network to this new network, uh, which has been merged but not yet accepted. Um, but essentially, we've been running it for a few months now, and at some point in the future, we plan to sunset the default uh, DRAN network. Um, so hopefully, people can vote on this FIP and we can get it um, accepted. Uh, a small note, the network that's running uh, in DRAM main at the moment, Fastnet, is being sunset for a very small compatibility change uh, uh, to be compliant with an RFC. That's literally one character in a domain separation tag, so it doesn't really affect any of the sort of uh, availability guarantees uh, that we've seen running it since March 1st. Um, some things that this new network enables are time lock encryption for a start, which is wonderful. We've been uh, shilling it everywhere for the past year, and hopefully we can see it on FEM sometime in the future if the FIP is accepted. Also it enables stateless round verification. So in the default network right now, you need to look back in the chain of uh, randomness to verify each new beacon. Uh, but in QuickNet and FastNet, the beacons are standalone, uh, which enables easier verification. Possibly in some far off future land, there are discussions of faster block times for Filecoin. Obviously, using this new DRAN network, it would enable at, at, at its fastest a three second <laughs> block time for the Filecoin network. Oh, bless you. Um, in terms of changes to Lotus or other implementations, it would require updating the, the DRAN client dependency, uh, which at least in the Go world kind of manages everything for you out of the box. Um, it would also require using a new chain hash to connect to this DRAN network, although the endpoints and other stuff all remain the same. Uh, I suppose the biggest change is that the Falcon network would have to consume uh, every 10th DRAND epoch rather than every epoch, although at least in the Lotus code base, that seems to be uh, kind of handled already. Uh, and then finally, we need to set a block height uh, for the switch, uh, of which there is already prior art. Uh, so for the, for the first, uh, I want to say 5,000 blocks of the Falcon network, um, they were running on the DRAND testnet. Now they're running on DRAM mainnet, um, so it would be uh, re-implementing such work uh, to switch to a new DRAM network. Uh, some outstanding questions I have on that, I guess, are the testing pipeline for that. How do we test it? Um, and, and whether Calibnet and Butterfly that need to be upgraded uh, with a view to um, the default network being sunset sometime in the future. Calibnet and Butterfly that probably also need upgraded, but as a non-Lotus dev, I'm not sure of the uh, state of affairs there. But that is basically everything related to the DRAN network switch. Great, thank you. Um, 
just to clarify also very quickly that um, this is considered, well, it's one of the FIPS that we're considering in scope for NB21, um, I believe. Um, and yeah, at the moment, we're still using the soft consensus method for, you know, a processing FIPS. And so we are not going to be voting on this. Um, it will just go through the last call period once um, the time is set. Um, I believe that's Jennifer or Ayush. I'm not sure who will be speaking. Uh, it's both of us, uh, <laughs> or one person by this point. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and thanks for presenting. Um, I think all of this makes sense. Uh, and honestly, very excited to, to have this. Uh, I, to, with an eye towards FIP acceptance, uh, my only question is kind of around correctness of this. Um, so I'm wondering if you can quickly just speak to uh, testing, auditing, you know, how is it, you know, DRAND has been working well for us. Uh, the current DRAND mainnet has been working well for us for many years, uh, but obviously if anything, if there are any issues with QuickNet, that's an issue with the PowerPoint mainnet. Uh, so I'm just wondering what kind of um, uh, hardening uh, or auditing has been done for QuickNet. Sure, in terms of testing, obviously we've been running it now um, in mainnet for, for quite a while. Um, and in fact, in testing even further before that, since um, late last year. Uh, in terms of auditing, we haven't specifically had the DRAN code base re-audited, but we have had uh, time lock encryption audited, which we built on top of this. Uh, that did involve a cursory look into our new schemes from Kudelsky Security, who I guess are one of the partners in the League of Entropy, and I think have done other stuff with the PL. Um, and they identified some faults um, in the Temple Crypt stuff, which we have remedied uh, months ago also. So. That is, uh, I hope, well-worn territory. Uh, yep, sounds good. Um, uh, we're kind of answering the last question that you have there. Uh, yes, calibration net and butterfly net would also have to be upgraded. Um, uh, and honestly, that's part of how we would be testing this change as well, is once it's all integrated, we'd upgrade the test networks, uh, first butterfly, then calibration. And at that point, if there are any issues, they emerge. Um, so yeah, in, in general, we just try to follow the same kind of upgrade lineage between mainnet and calibration net at least. Um, uh, and any number of people can run their own dev nets for kind of preliminary testing of this. Um, and the other thing I'd say is, uh, and this is very much an issue for Lotus and the clients, is uh, I, I, we've not really done a switch like this, um, uh, at least in Lotus, uh, in a long while, arguably ever. We haven't made so profound a change to the beacon schedule. Uh, as you mentioned, at least in Lotus, we do have a lot of this logic already, but it's never really been tested. You know, there's so the confidence we have in it are to the level of a couple unit tests, maybe. Uh, so I think, uh, at least speaking for Lotus, we'll have some some cleaning up of house to do or, or some confidence gaining to do, uh, but that's unrelated to the core of the fit. <laughs> that's very much, we, we have some work to do and we'll do it. Um, but otherwise, I see no problem with this, and I think we're all generally excited uh, to have this go live. Thanks. Um, I think we have a couple of comments in the chat box. Um, one from Zen Ground. Uh, is it correct that this means that there will be no increase in bytes stored in the block header? Um, so actually, it would mean there is a reduction in the number of bytes stored in the black block header uh, because we changed our signature scheme slightly um, so that now, uh, for the technical details, the, the signatures are on G1 rather than G2 um, uh, group in, in BLS. So that would actually reduce uh, the size, but potentially we can do some padding or something if that is an issue. Great. Um, I will hand it back to Stephen, and then I'll come back to you, Jennifer. Uh, how expensive is the time of encryption in terms of time? Uh, like, is it just a perfect in... processor? Is it what, sorry? Sorry, as, as in like, like if I try to like use time of encryption to decrypt some some message, like is that going to take me in the order of uh, milliseconds, nanoseconds, like where? Um, yes, milliseconds. You have to do a pairing operation. So it's, it is quite expensive, although we've limited uh, our implementation limits, the amount of data you can actually time lock, uh, encrypt and decrypt. So the preferred method is really hybrid encryption. You, you yep. would encrypt just a key for something and then uh, use some other scheme to encrypt your real payload. I see. Is it possible to share this, this uh, process across multiple encrypted uh, ciphertexts, like decrypt multiple ciphertexts at once with one operation? Um, independent party. That is a good question. It possibly, uh, I would need to look into that, but they are in theory aggregatable. So I, I guess it should be possible. 
I'd add to Steven to answer your question. I discussed it in length back while back with Nicholas. Uh, in essence, the time of decryption is, is equivalent to signature verification for BLS. There's some pre-computation you can do to, like a DSP could provide some, a block producer could provide some pre-computation, but it, it gets harder to implement then, then because you have to assume that pre-computation might be done wrong and so on. I see, okay. Well, I'm, just, I'm thinking that maybe you could, like a block producer could do something somewhere, but yeah. Okay. That's Thanks. a huge thing. Okay, Jennifer? Uh, my my question is more around the potential rollout. So uh, for this one, like all the implementation has to switch to the new network, uh, you know, upon the upgrade epoch. Uh, I'm not sure that, like, I would love to ask Forrest to take a look at the steps soon and just let us know if there's any consistent challenge, challenges to implement that in Forrest. Because I, I think back in the early days, uh, we did a test with, with Lotus, uh, like, switching different like DRAM network. We even have to revisit in that code ourselves. However, back in the days, Forest was not uh, in the network yet. So this is gonna be the first time for Forest to do that. And we, I think it's very important for us to coordinate and testing this in a shared test net before even deploying any changes to calibration uh, on, this particular, uh, on this particular one. So like, uh, what, yeah, any comments from Forest will be, good, will be appreciated. Um, I just wanted to circle back to Molly's question around, she said, I think we made a DRAN network switch to the current mainnet back in September 2020. Can you clarify that for us, Patrick? Uh, sorry, yes, not, that's not, correct. Not, oh. okay. okay, perfect. I was just going to flag to Jennifer, like that's what Jennifer just mentioned of like, we, okay. did, we tested this one with Lotus, but we need to make sure that um, other networks uh, or other implementations get this nice and tested so that we don't run into any issues. Got that. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, just with it, with an eye towards getting this uh, accepted and and rolled out. Uh, I think the you know the FIP text itself is great, um, but not quite specific enough. So so I think it's not quite at the stage where an independent implementer could just sit down, read the FIP, update your implementation, and and be sure they're going to um, match. You know, describes the kind of changes that need to happen, but doesn't specify exactly how those changes must happen. Um, and so I think, and you know, we only have a few implementations to coordinate, and so we can, you know, uh, don't have to perfectly sequence this. Uh, and so you might need help from one of the implementations to like actually do the work once, and then you, then you've answered all the design questions, and you can write them down in the fit for everyone else to replicate. Uh, but I think that's necessary for us to get to um, accepting this fit. We, we probably need to actually do it first, um, and then and that sort of ties in with as Jim was saying, you're actually testing this change on a network that's not one of our long running test nets. Uh, so that we're confident it's going to work when we when we do that. I want to call out that Patrick has kindly offered help us do a prototyping the Lotus or so the Go version there. So once that is out, I can I think that can be you know Forest team may take a look at that sometimes in August and treat that as a reference implementation. You know just like to reduce some of the work analysis for the Forest team and then obviously it's possible the Go implementation has something wrong or whatever. Uh, Ideally, Forest team can help us call those potential bugs out too. But uh, but yes, just want to let you know there expect to be a Go implementation sometimes in August uh, that we can we can check out. Right? Uh, just uh, yes, that's correct. Um, also related to that, we do have a community Rust library um, for everything DRAN related. Uh, it's not strictly handled by our team, but there's at least some prior art there for the Forest folk uh, that they can pick it up and modify or use it directly. Uh, depending on their appetite. Great, thank you. We can definitely continue the conversations async. Um, the FIP draft is ready. Anyone can, you can always uh, weigh in on that. Um, let's see, over to you, Stabilian, on the Beyond FVM discussion. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so sorry, this should be Beyond FEVM. Uh, so beyond FEVM, uh, we're still sticking with the FEM, at least for the moment. Um, uh, but yeah, basically, we we launched uh, FEVM, uh, and that's live on the network, uh, but uh, we still don't have uh, native actors um, uh, or like native 
uh, native WASM actors that anyone can deploy. Um, and we're, we're currently working towards this for a few reasons. Uh, one is it enables um, any target or any language that can target WebAssembly. Um, uh, and that is not well written, but whatever. Um, yeah, so basically we can target any language that targets WebAssembly, such as Rust. Um, uh, these actors will get direct access to IPv blocks so they can sort of create their own IPv data structures. And importantly, they get copy and write semantics for their internal state, which is something you don't get in something like um, uh, like the EVM. Uh, and finally, uh, WebAssembly actors sh should have improved performance depending on how we do it. Uh, but these are these are kind of the the reasons why we're looking at uh, enabling uh, more native WebAssembly actors. Uh, next slide. So unfortunately, this is not easy. Um, yeah, so we've been working on this for a while and trying to, to deal with all the interesting problems, but there are three core problems. One, um, the current WASM VM we use uh, has an expensive compilation step where it compiles the WebAssembly module to native, or to your native architecture, because it's not actually, it doesn't, it doesn't interpret the actors. It actually compiles them down to your native architecture, like x86 or whatever, uh, and then executes that. Um, uh, and this, like, this is an optimized compiler that takes an arbitrary amount of time. Uh, so if we want to do this safely in a way where we can like actually charge the correct amount of gas for this kind of operation, uh, for example, we're compiling an untrusted actor, we would probably need to use either some kind of single pass compiler that basically just takes one pass over the code and doesn't do anything fancy, or potentially interpret the WASM module instead of actually compiling it. Uh, the second tricky part here is actually charging gaps for running uh, these WASM modules. Right now, we can run at basically near data speeds and, and charge gas pretty accurately based on like how long these, these actors take to execute. Um, but one of the tricky things is like, because WASM is so close to native, because it compiles into a native, um, like things like, for example, like uh, cache misses uh, in your instructions or like branch mispredictions and stuff like that really affect your runtime. Uh, so if you wanted a gas model that was actually like secure in a world where people can deploy arbitrary and potentially malicious uh, native actors, then we'd have to be a lot more conservative instead of making the gas model based on like average and expected execution times. Uh, we need to make the gas model based on on worst case execution times. Uh, and we have some concerns here that this could like drastically uh, increase gas fees. Um, so currently in both these cases, we're looking at kind of a two world scenario where we have like the, the built-in actors that get charged one thing uh, or one set of gas fees, and then the the sort of like user deployed actors that may run a bit slower and may cost a bit more. Uh, but this is still complicated and kind of out there. Uh, yeah. And the final part of this is just like this, like there aren't any other IPLD based uh, uh, blockchains that are like WASM based blockchains. And they do some interesting things that are like you know, the many different types of blockchains, but like it's, there's nothing that like looks exactly like ours. Um, uh, so like with, with Fevum, we could just sort of copy the EVM and that was easy. Uh, but with, um, uh, with, with this, like with, with like the FVM itself, before, once we start letting users deploy native actors directly on top of the FVM, we have to really think through and, and be careful about the APIs we expose, uh, because it becomes very hard to change these kinds of things once you've, you've exposed them to users. Uh, so yeah, those are the current challenges we're facing. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, so those are the challenges we're facing. Now, um, uh, basically, we, we have a few options, ways to, to deal with this. Uh, the, sh the shortest term approach for sort of native actors is don't. It's basically saying, okay, don't deploy these native actors to the file mainnet. Instead, deploy them to L2s, for example, via IPC. Um, uh, the upside is we can do this potentially immediately with no upgrades. The downside is there's no direct integration. IPC is still very alpha in early stages. Uh, so a lot of users like, if they want to deploy to something that's sort of like, I don't know, they, 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 it might be more risky for, for users um, and it won't cover all use cases. Uh, a soonish approach is the one that I actually want to talk about here. Uh, this is what I, I wrote up um, uh, in the FIP discussion, uh, if you've been paying attention to, to the ongoing FIP discussions. Um, uh, and this is this idea of allowing uh, users to sort of contribute, contributed actors that still get deployed through FIPS. So like right now we have this whole FIP process where you, you have to like, um, if you want to change the network, you have to make this extensive proposal to explaining why you want to make this change, how this change works and everything related to it. Um, what I'd like to do is propose a slightly more simplified process where you still write a FIP uh, and you still have to like describe why you want this change and, and stuff like that. But like, you don't have to get into quite as much detail about exactly how your actor works um, as long as as, as the, the core implementers can then read uh, the proposal, 
read the code, verify that it seems to be sane, and then just go with it. Um, uh, the, the idea is that this this could, in theory, be lighter weight because like these steps likely won't be changing fundamental like uh, protocol level things. They'll just be basically adding a new actor into the system. Um, so that, that's the sort of the soonish approach that I'm proposing here. There's a more midterm uh, approach which would probably ship around uh, Q1, Q2 of next year, and this is basically just deploy a, a WebAssembly interpreter to the network. This is going to be slow, um, uh, but it's it's an option for some users who just they just want to target Rust. They don't care about performance. They just need to target something like Rust or some language that is not Solidity, basically. Um, and then the long term approach is actually like fully permissionless, fast WebAssembly actors. But that unfortunately, like, hopefully would ship in 2024. But it's still complicated. So there's a lot of unknowns. So these are the four sort of paths that I see here. Um, and the one I'm currently proposing is, is the soon one, uh, the permission contributed uh, actors. Um, uh, the other one that I think is, is somewhat viable is, is the sort of midterm approach of like shipping interpreter. Also, the, none of these approaches are, are exclusive. So like uh, we can just do all four, uh, but the question is like, do we want the intermediate steps as well? Uh, so that that's what I want to talk about here. Um, uh, we do have uh, the potential first user here on the call uh, if he's, if they're there, so it's some influence. Ah, oh, there. Yeah, yeah, we're here. we're here. right here. Um, I was hoping if we have time, uh, if you could give a like a, a short intro and like, hey, yeah. this is is what we're building, and this is why we we want to ship yeah. a, a built an actor. Could I share the screen? I actually did prepare some slides. Yes, you can. You can actually uh, take over. You should be good uh, to great. Go Thank you. Got it now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Bernhard with Fluence. Some of you I've met, some of you I haven't. Thanks for having us. So we're Fluence, we're decentralized serverless compute, and uh, we are off chain. And we've decided uh, quite some time ago that our on chain home for marketplaces and verification should be the Filecoin network, FEM. And uh, part of that is related to the uh, uh, prospect of having a WebAssembly runtime. <laughs> so we talked uh, on and off to the team in various uh, uh, capacities at various times, and we are currently on testnet and put a milestone in the ground for our roadmap for a Q4 minimal viable mainnet on Filecoin. As part of that drive, we are interested now in uh, exploring the use of uh, the WebAssembly runtime for one of our WebAssembly modules called AquaVM. That module on-chain would be acting as a verifier for some off-chain compute. So it wouldn't be running compute, it would be a verifier for off-chain compute. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into that uh, uh, in detail and after, uh, asking if we could start building on it and, and uh, uh, what the possibility of uh, Q4 deliverable of the capability is. Sorry, Bruno, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but your screen is not being shared at the moment. Okay, got it. It, it is now. Okay. You're good, yeah, yeah, keep going, sorry. All right. Okay, okay. So where was that? Yeah, so that uh, that we actually synced on the, on the Q4 mainnet release. That in part, uh, I think, I believe at least, uh, um, Stephen proposed uh, seven in, in that uh, beyond if you have additional run to make actors discussion of it. And um, so here we are. We fundamentally believe that uh, obviously it's a pretty significant commitment from our side. So the earlier towards the Falcon network and the earlier we can test and play with it, the better. We have alternatives and I can uh, briefly speak to them in a little bit, but. Uh, how many of you know who Fluence is? I don't want to bore anybody. Otherwise, can, we can run briefly through what Fluence does and is and why it's important, what we want to do. OK, I only see five people at, at any given time. So one person knows, two people know. OK, let me run through real quick. If, if, if I bore you, uh, just uh, say stop, and uh, we'll just accelerate the whole thing. 
So what Fluence does is decentralized stateless serverless compute protocol. So it's basically a decentralized Lambda, which is very, very different from other solutions, including Bacalao, which are more managed sort of on the EC2 type container side. Uh, we run on uh, Wasm containers, not uh, uh, Docker. And uh, as I said, the compute is off chain. We have multiple components in our reference peer. One is called Marine, which is our own Wasm runtime, which is built on Wasm time at this point. And we have Aqua, which is distributed choreography and composition engine. Basically what you do is the developer writes some business logic in Rust, compiles it to WASI, deploys it to one or more peers out in that network, and then uses Aqua to compose these services into whatever compute solutions, applications, even protocols. The services in Fluence are not REST or JSON RPC accessible. They're only P2P accessible. Therefore, Aqua functions also as a, 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 a composer at that P2P level. So this is all off chain. However, we have a very significant on chain component and that includes multiple marketplaces, including the marketplaces that uh, match developers with uh, capacity providers, peers, peer providers, operators and marketplaces to uh, to run capacity provisioning. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit. And we also want to run a bunch of verifiers. We have a, a variety of proofs, proof of uh, execution, proof of uh, correctness, proof of capacity, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one of those verifiers actually would be the very Aqua VM we have on every peer enabling the distributed choreography and composition to quote unquote rerun a probabilistic sample subset of the execution traces on chain, which drives payment. The important part here is it drives payment settlement between uh, uh, developers and uh, capacity or capacity consumers and capacity providers. As I said, we want to be on uh, Falcon with a minimal viable mainnet in Q4. Mike, Sorry to cut you own... short, Bennett. Um, how much time do you think you need to finish up? Or is how, much time that... do you want, how much time um, do you want me? We, we, um, I can give you just two minutes to round up so that we can okay. move okay. forward. All right, so let me yeah. just move next. So. So as part of uh, uh, our move to, to Filecoin, we believe we bring a lot of uh, uh, benefits to the community. And part of it all hinges on, uh, not entirely on Aqua VM being able to run. Uh, our biggest, uh, we, we in, in heavy discussions with uh, multiple SPs to, uh, to provide excess CPU capacity to the Fluence network. And I can't speak exactly who it is, but those of you who were at SP, ESPA 7 probably saw me talk to, they, they should know who I talked to and uh, who we're talking to. And we, we do believe we can uh, uh, reveal some of the partners very soon, but uh, the latest in October at, at the uh, ESPA slash uh, Phil Vegas event. Uh, we, we're also bringing some other partners in uh, with a variety of uh, MPC solutions, which we also uh, feel is, uh, is uh, very beneficial to the community as well as uh, the, the Falcon network. And uh, Fluence has been, I think, uh, an active partner with uh, many, many uh, Falcon events and uh, the Falcon community for several years on a global scale. And obviously we continue, we would like to continue this commitment and actually accelerate and extend this commitment. So that's sort of in a nutshell, uh, from an alternative perspective, there are alternatives. Uh, we currently run testnet on Near and Aurora. I don't really like it for a mainnet solution. So within the Filecoin ecosystem, it's IPC as an L2. IPC itself isn't particularly, it, it's, it's early. We are considering if at an L2 for, for another part of the solution. However, since AquaVM drives settlement, the security and the responsiveness of, uh, you know, quote unquote L1 real time uh, certainly would be a tremendous benefit for the solution. Uh, thank you. So much. Um, if you could make those slides available as well so that I can include them um, when I am sending uh, the, the slides out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, let me try to get us back on track. Right, uh, we have the poor rep security uh, policy discussion. Um, can we do that in five, ten minutes? It depends how many questions I get, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so yes. hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, I would like to 
but to introduce power security priority and replacement ceiling enforcement. It's a, F a F FIP that replaces FIP 0047, uh, which was the power security policy because we noticed a significant simplification that we can make towards uh, in that FIP. The primary change is that instead of explicitly scheduling a replacement ceiling for every sector that SP has, we we uh, we require the storage providers to replacement uh, replacement seal their sectors over the period of one, one and a half years. So just just also high level because I assumed everyone knows FIP forty seven. FIP forty seven addresses uh, the the risk of uh, power up. Uh, construction becoming uh, broken in some shape or form, either through uh, through computational advancements or a uh, some development in cryptography or something like that. Uh, so in that case, currently the po the default policy as we have right now is that a sector's commit a sector's commitments are at maximum one and a half years, and in case of breakage for a breakage, we would prevent, uh, disallow participants in the network to extend the commitments on their sectors. Thus, the vulnerable sectors would expire after one and a half years. Uh, the FIP47 and FIP67 focus on maintaining that adult guarantee, while at the same time uh, allowing us to move to towards longer commitment periods uh, and to enable, uh, for example, longer deal, deal durations. So, uh, as I mentioned, the primary change is that we don't schedule the replacement ceiling explicitly in case of a power of vulnerability, we would we just require search providers to replacement seal over time. Uh, this brings some benefits. The search providers uh, are not required to refresh sectors periodically as it was described in 547. And also they have complete freedom over sequencing of how, how and when they seal which sectors, as long as they uh, they follow the linear trajectory in, ag uh, in aggregate. So essentially, they have to offload their story, uh, their old old sectors uh, linearly over time, and uh, at least linearly, not slower. And then onboard uh, and through replacement ceiling mechanism. And failure to follow the replacement schedule initially leads to uh, inability to produce blocks, uh, recoverable faults. But after some time, we have to uh, terminate those sectors. Otherwise, uh, ter terminate a some chunk of the sectors. Otherwise, uh, there are issues with imbalance between what's in the power table and who can produce blocks. Uh, next slide, please. So, what does FIP67 bring us bring us in relation uh, in comparison to, to 47 is that schedule is no longer necessary, which significantly reduces the amount of additional state and bookkeeping we have to do. For the same reason, there is no need for immediate uh, implementation uh, code implementation of the of the uh, FIP. Although that uh, having that code implemented would make uh, enabling it when we need it much, much easier because we would have already the code. And l let me remind you that uh, the case we are thinking here is a power rep breaking for some reason. Thus, there all already will be a lot of things to do and uh, create uh, and write. Uh, it introduces only two aggregate state variables uh, per minor instance. Uh, in comparison to previously, we would have essentially the the number of uh, the amount of state it, like uh, in previous uh, implementation uh, it reuse uh, we reuse the uh, expiration queue uh, which led to very complex code and additional state there uh, we can so like the minimal thing we can do I, f I think we can introduce placeholders for those state var variables uh, in whatever nearest upgrade we want such that at least we don't have to migrate the core state, although we will still have to uh, migrate the shape of the state and thus increase the complexity of changing the tooling. But we will have to uh, perform a migration when, when we want to enable, nevertheless, uh, to populate those entries and uh, those entries, especially one entry, which is the initial old sectors, uh, where we populate it with the count of sectors with longer expiration than one and a half years which is very small migration comparison what the migration for, for FIP47 would be. And just 
I want to highlight that migration, which says the initial sectors should happen when we want to enable the mechanism, not right now. Uh, any questions? Seb, do you have a, I see you're unmuted, no? I saw him shake his hand. So just okay. to highlight, this replaces FIB 47, which I think was accepted previously. Although don't quote me on that, Alex. Thanks, not, not a question for you, because I understand this, but um, a question for everyone uh, is how can we, uh, you know, uh, what's our next step with this proposal, uh, which has now you know, been written up and published for months now. Um, and how do we get it into the point where everyone knows that this is the plan um, in case we do have a problem and we know what the steps are? Um, so I would like to, I mean, I, I propose, I, I think our current process actually suits this quite well, where uh, we can make any amendments and, ex and, and put this FIP through the acceptance process um, without mandating that we do any work straight away, uh, because the process is currently, you know, get governance acceptance and then core devs decide when to implement it. Uh, you know, they have a mandate to sort of do so, but but some discretion. Um, so if we accept this FIP, that doesn't mean we're committing to doing any of this work right now, um, but it means we're now, Cordes can then decide, you know, when is the right time for us to do this uh, implementation work, um, which sets us up for then the easy path should this ever, ha ever happen. Um, I don't think we should uh, withhold accepting this FIP based on not wanting to do the work right now. Uh, those two steps are, uh, decoupled in our current process on, on purpose. I think, um, in my opinion, that's pretty much correct. Um, we can, I mean, the FIP will continue to go uh, follow the process as normal, um, and then core devs can decide, you know, based on uh, engineering requirements or resources or interests when to shovel that for maybe implementation. Um, I don't think it, it makes sense to, you know, only wait until we're ready to implement before we take it through the acceptance process. Um, I mean, if it's ready uh, for last call, um, we can. Um, otherwise, uh, well, that's my that's my opinion. I'm not sure if if anyone else wants to add on that. Great. Okay. Um, are there additional questions on this before we quickly move on? No. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, before we do this, I'll let Molly jump in for her shout outs and then I hand over to Caitlin. Thanks, Lucky. Um, I can present, but I also don't need to if you want to just make it easy. Um, I wanted to give folks a heads up um, here about uh, the Falcoin Dev Summits that we're organizing uh, with the Falcoin Foundation in. Uh, September. Um, the aim is that we're going to have two summits, regional summits, one in Asia, one in Europe, North America. Um, Asia is going to be uh, Singapore, the 12th through 14th of September, and Europe, North America will be in the thing that borders the intersection of those two continents, which is Iceland, uh, September 25th through 27th. Um, and the aim here is that these are going to be protocol development um, conversation venues talking about um, improvements to um, kind of the tech stack, um, getting good alignment on how we see the upgrade path for implementations, network scalability, data onboarding tooling, et cetera, um, improving over time. Um, we're still in, in the planning stages right now, but um, are starting to reach out to folks uh, like, like core devs and others to um, join these venues and host tracks. There is a, um, a website, uh, we're trying to keep this to be a limited venue. It's not trying to be a big, uh, you know, Phil X, Phil Bangalore style conference. It's it's focused on um, developers, um, protocol engineers, um, tool builders, et cetera, who are talking and aligning about how we build this awesome network together going forward. Um, and so we're through that, not just opening up attendance to everyone. Um, uh, so if you, I expect and hope that everyone uh, here uh, uh, attends um, this venue. And if you're paging into the core dev calls, that probably means that you are engaged in protocol development. So if you see the recording of this, nudge, nudge, we'd also um, 
uh, love to have have you apply and hopefully come to one of those two events. The aim is that we'll do Asia first, um, have really good open conversation about how we see um, some of these areas improving, a little bit more of a focus on data onboarding, storage provider tooling, um, so like SP Stack, um, and then build towards in Iceland, having a little bit more of a concrete vision about protocol development and scaling opportunities with a deeper focus on um, retrievals, clients, layer two networks, building on Filecoin and Filecoin scaling solutions, um, and like retrieval incentives and checkings and things like that. Um, and so we're working on getting that all into the website, but uh, all of you here today, encourage you to just drop that apply button, mention you're in the core devs working group and um, start booking time on your calendars uh, for one of those two slots, fingers crossed. Um, but really uh, looking forward to getting together in person to get to jam on some of these awesome design ideas and plan not just the current open FIPS, but what we expect to see one to two years or three years from now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Caitlin. Sure. Uh, thanks, Molly. Thanks, Lucky. Um, just wanted to come in and, and speak briefly about what we have more or less collectively agreed to as the upgrade timeline for NB21, uh, which we're calling the watermelon upgrade since we originally thought that it would land midsummer. <laughs> Um, it has been pushed out a little bit, but we think probably for the best, um, and we are expecting the next mainnet upgrade to be on November 7th. Um, we're going to be working together with Jennifer and Lucky to coordinate all of the FIPS for this, while we also work to unblock some of the stickier FIPS process issues that we've been talking about for the last couple of months as well. Um, so the three of us will be coordinating communications in the coming weeks. Uh, but one thing I wanted to specifically flag is that um, a lot of teams are working under uh, pretty tight capacity at the moment. And we have had a pretty set scope for FIPS that are going to be included in NV21 for the past several months. Um, yep, I can let Lucky speak to this if he wants to, because he'll be helping to facilitate ensuring everything reaches last call by an appropriate time, et cetera. Um, but please know that the cutoff period for last call FIPS is going to be September 15th. Um, even though upgrade is going to land in, on chain in November, we are not going to be accepting any FIPS proposed or entering last call after this point. Um, so if your team is working on something that you really think needs to be in this network upgrade, that it's really going to cause a lot of downstream issues, if not, um, but that there is not yet currently a draft open, uh, please be sure to flag this to us ASAP, because as we get closer and closer to this upgrade uh, deadline, we're going to have fewer and fewer resources available to accommodate the work that you may have in progress. Um, particularly if it's not fully visible to us right now. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, we do use this public channel for all of our planning purposes. Um, we always have, same one as usual. <laughs> uh, we will also begin to share these dates more publicly across Slack um, and on Twitter as well. Um, and one thing I want to also flag is that this was a particularly difficult upgrade to schedule. Um, and I think this difficulty is only going to increase as more teams want to join core devs, as more folks come into the network. Uh, as FIPS themselves become more complicated. Um, and so we've sort of re-raised this issue of potentially moving to pre-scheduled network upgrades um, in 2024, okay? Um, this is just a discussion, like everything else, uh, core devs, this is a group that we all kind of work together to structure and run. If you have opinions, ideas, or thoughts on this, um, please raise them so that we are aware of them and we can take your needs into account. Um, but there is a discussion forum that has already been opened uh, for the pre-scheduled uh, network upgrade scheduling suggestion as well. Uh, so please take a look at this if you have not, especially if you have opinions. Otherwise, I think there's lots of good Q&A we can also delve into today, so I'm going to stop for now, but likewise, happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Yes, Jennifer. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, I just want to call out of oh. From this like existing list, there's one other FIP effort that Lotus team and along with some other teams are closely tracking is Alex's work on direct data onboarding, which allowing commit data directly to the sectors, uh, either verified or non-verified, or without um, directly interacting with um, the market actor. Uh, many of the team, including Lotus Manager team, Boost team, Singularity Spade, which are the client side of tooling, uh, are, are actively tracking this work. And we are hoping to support this uh, in, we're aiming to support this in V21, just because of the overall benefit it brings to the, to the network. And the 
opportunities it enables to use a storage market, but also it significantly reduced the cost for storage provider to onboarding data into the network today. Uh, we we believe there's a net, uh, positive like impact on the network. That's why we are hoping to get this supported in UB21. I don't know if Alex has anything to add to this topic. Um, yes, also, Stephen, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that one. Uh, also, we need to make a long-term fix to the market actor for the cron uh, problem that we short-term fixed in the last upgrade. Um, there's no fit for that, but it's uh, well understood what we need to do, um, and we're working on it. Um, so, so somehow I'm. Uh, so there was some. I don't want to spend a long time on this. There, there was obviously some confusion between uh, on the scope in for this upgrade. In you initially the date was more like now, and in which case the scope that's proposed made sense. But when the date was pushed back, and we're only getting one this year, there was sort of I think we we somehow missed the like okay, so what should our new scope be? Um, because these two very significant things are, are missing from it. Um, I'll I'll go and write them in the um, appropriate GitHub discussion as well now. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure there was a very clear call for for what should our new scope be with, with the much later deadline. Thanks, Alex. Step. Yeah, BM team is in some of the, some of the position where we have several FIPS in process. Uh, one is already up, and hopefully it will be merged uh, as a draft very soon around IPLD reachability. I'm hoping to present that in the next um, uh, core devs call. Uh, another one is basically trying to like uh, clean up a lot of the the FDM uh, syscall APIs uh, to make them a little well, really just a little bit safer. Uh, for uh, and like to user deployed actors to use when we eventually allow those. Uh, another one is um, uh, around just like also cleaning up a few more security things. Uh, we're like they're not currently security issues, but they would be security issues if we allow user deploy actors. Uh, and I think those are the main ones. Uh, but yeah, basically we have these. We have I think like three or four FIPS that we're going to be hopefully proposing. We can try to shrink them down to, into fewer FIPS. Um, uh, just fewer bigger bigger hips because they're actually not very complicated, most of them at least. Um, I'll let Caitlin jump in after uh, Jennifer just to maybe if there are immediate responses or or additional questions. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, I was going to echo what Alex and both Alex and Steven mentioned on the clarity on the uh, on the timeline stuff. I have been mentioning that others than the FIP we should really try to decouple the FIP process from the network upgrade that the ideal world will be you have all the FIP accepted and then they are getting prioritized and scheduled in the upcoming network upgrades. However, that's not how we work today because of the nature of development uh, in the network these days. However, I think it's very important from an implementation perspective to have a cut off like basically like scope date rather than just the FIP last call, because for implementation team, we plan monthly, quarterly, and things like that. We need to allocate engineering resources to support the FIP authors to actually implementing the FIPs to be finalized in the network upgrade. So when the these days, the last call deadline is always two weeks before the code freeze. It makes really, really hard for like implementations to be reactive and support and planning of our work and resources with the current timeline. So what I would really like in the pre-scheduled network upgrade world is if we're expecting, say, hypothetically, say we have an upgrade scheduled in next year, February, I would love all the potential fit us, uh, FIPS to be prioritized in that upgrade to be registered uh, uh, with the uh, uh, implementation team, say, no later than December. So we have at least two months to implementing all the FIPS that's important to the network. I think that cut off date is very important and needs to be aligned across implementation teams and core dev. Um, welcome to hear the feedbacks from other implementation teams as well. Um, before you go step, um, Caitlin, you had your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Uh... I'm not sure. I, I want to think about Jennifer's comments a little bit more. Um, I, I think if you, I mean, if if the implementation teams want to suggest a cutoff date, then that's great. Uh, we can help incorporate that as part of um, sort of the, the cutoff for starting last call. I think Alex is going to note that there wasn't really this transition between talking about different timelines and potentially rescoping. 
uh, is a good one. And if there are more smaller FIPS and implementation teams feel like they have the resources to allocate to those, then that's great. Uh, one thing I was going to suggest publicly, um, but also as a note for you, Lucky, it might be really helpful as we move closer and closer and potentially to a, a scope assertion cutoff date. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Um, if in the weekly governance update that there is a very explicit list of what we're currently considering in scope, so that there is something that um, historically every single week we can reference to see when those things are changed, and then when there are changes that those can be flagged specifically for core devs. Um, things move really, really quickly, and it's easy to get lost in Slack, um, and I think this is important enough that we want folks to be able to quickly know where to find the most up-to-date information. So something to think about and something we should probably plan for. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, Steph? Uh, I just want to note that it also, like, all of this really depends on what type of FIP you have. There are some FIPs that require extensive changes to the clients. So There's some FIPs that require basically extensive implementation work by the FIP author first before they can even post the FIP. Uh, so, for example, a lot of the FIPs from the FVM, the, unfortunately, like, at the moment, there is only one FVM implementation. So we do all the implementation work, fit work first uh, to figure out, like, is this going to actually work? How is this going to work out? Then we write the FIP. Then we try to get people to accept it. Um, and at that point, like, as long as there's little integration work, and this is this is where it gets tricky. Where like I, I don't know if we can pick like a good cutoff because some things like in some cases it'll be very much like okay, some pros the FIP and there's a bunch of implementation work afterwards. In other cases, like all of that will be done and the FIP will basically be, hey, this is done. Can we ship this thing? Um, so I think we really have to like. I don't think we can have hard cutoffs here. I think like basically once the FIP is accepted, then you 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 talk to the core to see okay how much time it will take. To actually integrate this and that's when you decide whether or not it actually gets launched i totally i totally agree with you there like you know different fips has different nature of development i think what i'm asking is at least we have ideation like a fit discussion started early and then the the um whatever proposed discussion can early on talk to the implementation team suggesting that hey this is the effort i'm working on and i'm hoping to get accepted by the file queen network please keep an eye an eye on this, we might be working closely over the next couple of weeks or months to implementing this and potentially finalizing this in a network upgrade. I think that's what I mainly was asking. Thank you. Raul? Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, just an idea here. I, want, I wonder if uh, to make this process effective as well, it would make sense to commit to having a global pipeline uh, DAC rank slash whatever that we all implementation teams and uh, teams that are working on specific components commit to keeping updated on a on a specific cadence. It could it could align with the core devs meetings uh, in terms of that also elicits things that they see on the horizon that might not yet have reached a fib discussion uh, might be in discussion stage. Uh, might be an implementation stage and really it's like a, this instrument would serve uh, for like I think it would provide greater alignment and that it would allow teams to flag uh, more publicly to the community the things that they're working on so such that when there is a specific cutoff date if that gets uh, placed or if there is like we could align that work better and really understand well these things are like likely in like you know in finalization stage when it comes to implementation and uh, they're very close to and that data aligns very closely with like a potential cutoff date or a potential pre-scheduled upgrade uh does it make sense to give some slack maybe because i don't think like having very hard dates uh and fixed dates on on these uh on the upgrades is uh super super feasible i think there needs to be some slack give and take because things things arise and uh potentially like you know some network upgrades do require uh, uh, more uh, testing uh, ahead of time, and like the com the 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 path towards the network network upgrade might be more complicated in terms of kind of like the the global actions that that core devs need to take, uh, uh, test nets, and so on. So I'm wondering if like having visibility in greater visibility into the implementation timeline, uh, into the implementation pipeline, sorry, uh, would kind of like bridge the gap here. Uh, any immediate response or additional comments? I think uh, these are things that, in my opinion, are we you know constantly thinking about, um, trying to improve and make it more 
walkable, especially in terms of the visualization and the visibility of work that teams are doing. Um, I personally have a problem with cutoff dates. I know that it helps implementation teams, but I'm not sure if that's good practice in governance. That's my personal opinion. Um, uh, to have these things set and then we say after this time, you know, we can accept anymore, or I don't know if that's if that's good practice, but I guess it's usually helpful for implementation teams and engineering teams to plan resources very well in advance. But I just wanted to drop my my personal thoughts on that. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, any immediate thoughts? Um, um, yeah, Alex. Since we have the minutes, um, yeah, I think both you and, and Roel make some good points uh, um, about this. Um, <clears throat> our ultimate goal, I, I would claim, is to you know, deliver improvements to the network um at a you know at a good pace to deliver good improvements as, as as fast as we can and but not move you know obviously not not move too fast um I, that's the outcome we want i would sort of question like what i'm not quite sure what's so broken about our current process like i agree i agree it's like there's some friction there's some confusion we're not exactly sure but um it it, it doesn't seem that broken to me um that we you know not having a cutoff date um, we need this FIP acceptance cutoff data. I totally understand why we have that, and it's, it seems like a reasonable uh, distance ahead of the um, the um, the network upgrade. Um, I think more transparency from implementation teams, uh, including you know things like the FVM and the actors and so on, about what they're working on, you know, published more would greatly help engineering teams uh, plan their plan their work. Um, but I'm not sure that adding more process to it is going to get us to ship more stuff faster. I'm not at all convinced that that would be an improvement. I can share what's broken today for uh for the uh, at least from the Lotus uh perspective. And again, I want to hear from Venus and Forest as well. Yes, for example, we already did our we did our quarterly planning uh, early, earlier in the summer. We have two two months three months of work that we then identified important for Lotus and Lotus Manor to work on. Uh, right now to and as you shared direct data onboarding project with us um, uh, last month we had to drop other priorities that we already planned and you know based on our using uh based on our user requests and things like that to support this effort um we are supporting this project because we do see higher impact uh, from your project compared to whatever other things in our backlog however it is creating great disruptions to our team's planning and resource allocations and you know, su uh, suppresses the same goes to the boost team as well. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. Um, Raul, is that a new hand or an, an old hand? No, okay. It's a stale um, hand. Sorry. Okay. Um, again, I want to use. I, I believe some most of our editors are on this call. Uh, just another appeal. Um, but you know, for us to ship these things quicker, I would rely on you to process these PR drafts as quickly as possible. Um, rather than having them stay endlessly in the repos. So please, um, I'll be sending nudges and reminders constantly uh, asking us to process these uh, reviews as quickly as possible so that we can move quickly with the timelines. I mean, uh, September 15 is around the corner. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. Again, register for our community governance calls and join the Field Ghost Slack channel, continue the conversation, all of the links referenced and all of the materials referenced, I'll put them all in the notes and share around um, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of the day. Bye.